everybody and welcome all thanks to LD Mobile. It is NBL Overtime. Hashtag NBL Overtime to get involved. Plenty to get into. That's kind of cool because we've got signings to talk about. Liam Santamaria, hello to you. Hello, Cam. Uh, good to have a bit of an extended panel to, yes. to get going today and have a look at Corey. Big fella, looking sharp. What up, man? What, what, <laughs> is that for us or do you have something else on? It's definitely not for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel a little insecure. I rolled in like a $7 T-shirt, then Homicide rolls in like he's just had a wedding rehearsal. But uh, no, you look good, man. You look good. Thanks, man. My bad, guys. I should have <laughs> gave you guys a heads up. But anyway, what's going on? We've got the coolest oh. coach in the NBL. The coolest I'm coach? Sure. No doubt. All right, he there you go. He wears so sneakers with, with his suits. His suits? So I rock with him. His footwear, we talk to Simon Mitchell, South East Melbourne Phoenix coach, heading into what will be his second season as head coach. Mitch, welcome to NBL Overtime. Yeah, thanks for having me, Cam. And I'm excited. I just appreciate you classing up the joint with these two bums. Way to look <laughs> good, man. Oh, I'll be honest. I, have you got a towel in your hand, Mitch? Uh, <laughs> like, are you doing this? You doing this freehand, are you? Are you no towel? Nah, no, no towel required today, man. <laughs> hey, it's been such a weird time and obviously it doesn't really need to be spoken about, but you had a win. You had the early win. There was the opt-out option for, for marquee players and, and certain players around the league. And your marquee player, Mitch Creek, who had a wonderful year last year, opted in. Uh, great news. And this is what, no, we had Mitch obviously on, on the show just after the announcement and, and he spoke about his decision-making. But leading up to that decision, did you leave that solely to him to make a financial individual decision or was the club involved in those type of chats and discussions? Yeah, well, I guess during the COVID-19 epidemic, um, uh, there was regular conversations being had between everybody in the club and Mitch um, on different levels, you know, just health, house things, uh, his rehabilitation from surgery, all the things that uh, uh, that go into, you know, sort of player coach relationship, player management relationship. And, um, you know, from, from our standpoint, I, or from my personal standpoint, I never put any pressure on Mitch. Um, this is a big decision for him, uh, a, a financial decision, um, and we let him make it on his own. There was no pressure applied. It was for him, his family, and his management to make that decision. But I was very confident all along um, that Mitch would make this decision because I feel like he's just that guy. You know, he's a guy who's loyal. He's a guy that's making a, a, a real indent into the southeast of Melbourne um, with uh, not just his game, but also his charisma. And uh, he's really leaving, he's going to leave a huge legacy here in, in uh, the southeast of Melbourne. And I just feel like that it was a job un, job not finished for him and, and for us. And uh, for me, the, the decision he made was obviously one that I appreciate, but uh, it's something I feel it's going to be good for his long term career as well. So, Mitch, with, with Creaky opting in, I mean, people tuning in. This time of the year, they want to hear about roster construction, you know, like uh, signing guys, making decisions. With, with Creaky opting in, that means you've got Creaky, Ty Wesley, Pino, Kyle Adnam and Adam Gibson under contract. You had the decision to make with regards to Ben Madgen and Dan Trist and the club and mutual options with, with those guys. Tell us, what, what, what bases do you think you guys have got covered now before you start adding other pieces? Yeah, I guess uh, we're pretty good at the four spot um, with, with, with Mitch and, uh, and, and the grown man. So, um, yeah, look, we, we, one of the things we're going into this off season trying to, trying to improve upon, obviously defensively we need to get better. Um, we feel like from a structural standpoint, whilst we're still uh, a long ways to go, we feel like we're, we're not that far off the mark, but we probably lack a little length and athleticism. So, um, for us and our decision making this off season is we wanted to sit back, um, wait until the free agency list comes out, have a look at who's going to be available, and then make decisions on how we improve our roster and push forward. Um, one of the things that's obviously really important with a new team is to build a little bit of continuity. Um, so we, we're lucky to have those guys already contracted. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't be continuing to re-sign guys that we had from last season. That's definitely uh, something that's we've put in place. Um, in regards to our roster construction, our team A, team B, team C, et cetera, down the line. Um, but we, see, we believe that we need to get longer and more athletic as well. So that's what, that'll be a focus for us come the, uh, come the free agency period. Now, Coach, we know in this league the most coveted positions to get right, point guard or center. Point guard position, you got it right. Center position, not so much. But it gave Dave Pinnell the opportunity to step up 
and show everybody he's a player in this league. How good was it from 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 that aspect to see Dane step up with that opportunity and nearly missed out on the MIP? Yeah, um, well, let's be honest, Corey, the most important position is the point guard position. We, 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 we try to give credit to them big guys, but we know what the truth is, right? Hey, Amen. Um, <laughs> point guard Joe. Yeah. Sorry, Cam, undersized two man right there. Um, <laughs> I still dropped 35 on you a couple of times, man. We continue on. <laughs> but yeah, look, um, the, the, the thing that happened with Dane wasn't by design. Um, we certainly had a lot of faith and confidence in what he was going to be able to achieve in the league, given opportunity. Um, I, I was really keen on getting Dane to Melbourne United when I was an assistant there. Um, we went and met with him um, when he was in school. And, uh, you know, we gave him the, the, the sell. Um, obviously, there's family uh, relationships between myself and, and Dane's family um, that go back 30-odd years. But uh, there's, um, you know, he's always a guy that was going to be an elite pick-and-roll defender, um, a chase-down rebounder, especially at the offensive end. Um, there's still a little bit of work to do at the offensive side of the ball um, with him. And we certainly want to add a few kilos to his body. But to have him come out and have the season that he did um, was a surprise in the, in the, I guess, from the aspect that I wasn't expecting him to play as much as he did. Um, once he established himself in the preseason as the better of our centers for our situation, um, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of like, let the man off the leash and go play hard. And, and he did that. Um, his body wore down a little bit as the season went on. Um, surprisingly, as it wore down, he put up better numbers. You know, some of the weeks where we didn't train at all with him, he went out and killed it. So, um, there's, a bit, look, there's a long way to go for him. He'll get a lot better. Um, but we still need to solidify that position as well and get him a little help. You talked about the point guard spot, Mitch. Where are things at in terms of John Robertson and the desire to bring him back or, or perhaps to look at, at other options? Yeah, obviously, John had a fantastic season. I think I've expressed my man crush on John um, throughout the year. Um, Wonderful guy, great player, great teammate. And we're continuing to talk with John. Um, obviously, the, the, the situation with what's happened in regards to COVID-19 and also the player salaries is something that we need to work around um, across the league, across the world. Um, you know, a lot of players and agents are really sitting back to go and to wait and see what's going to happen in Europe and how that's going to take place. So I don't think the players are in a rush and therefore, I don't think the clubs are in a rush. I think we're all kind of sitting back to wait and see how this thing unfolds. Um, after leaving us, John went to Turkey and, and, and played some wonderful basketball with Galatasaray. Um, there'll be a bit of demand for him, I'm sure. Uh, but the thing with John is that uh, it was an immediate love affair with our country. Um, and he's pretty open about that, that he, he really enjoyed his time, loves his teammates. Um, and, but the lifestyle was something that was a real eye-opener eye for him. Um, I guess that's one of the things when you recruit a guy out of uh, the the uh, the Russian leagues uh, <laughs> and, and bringing him to Australia and playing during our summer is that it could be a great eye opener. So it's something to keep in the back of the mind for the future. But we'd love to have John back. Um, you know, I think he'd be a better player being a second player in our league. Um, and I think that uh, if we can add that length around him because he's quite diminutive, then that will also help him as well. So uh, we'll continue to talk with John. And we'll see how that goes. Hey, Mitch, I remember. I uh, had a quick chat to you and Tommy Grew at the, at the NBL Awards night and, and, and we spoke about this on the show. Congratulated you on the way that, both of you on the way to, to start a franchise and be at the front of a franchise professionally. First year, it's always hard to do. And I, I felt, and we've spoken about this, both on and off the court, you did an amazing job. You didn't exactly, you had just lost that day as well and you're a competitive beast, so you weren't exactly like, yeah, you know what, well, you're still in game mode, I think. Now you've had some time to reflect. What is your overarching sort of thoughts and emotions on that, on that first season? Uh, still stewing a little bit in yes. the second half of the year, to be honest. Um, mm. right. you know, like it's, uh, we have had time to reflect. Like As soon as the season finished, um, we were straight into our um, reviews um, from Tommy to myself to all of the players to every staff members, how can we be better? Um, and you know, one of the things that we've developed since the beginning is just a real open and honest relationship um, in, in the organisation. Um, and nothing's personal. Everybody's pushing in the same direction to get better. So we had uh, a little bit of soul searching to do. Um, looking back, um, you know, we lost so many games by small margins in the last few minutes of games. 
it's easy to kind of say, yep, that's where we've got to improve. And it is certainly an area we've got to improve um, defensively. Uh, we have to make great stride. But we kind of knew coming into the season, you know, just doing studies on, uh, on, on all new franchises and teams coming in. You know, there's kind of two ways to go. You're going to be stripped behind the eight ball defensively because that's where chemistry and understanding um, of player habits really can, uh, you know, having that ongoing players returning, it really develops that chemistry. And we don't have that. We didn't have that. And um, we knew it was going to be an area um, of concern. Um, having said that, there's also the thing we've got to put bums on seat. So, yeah, we can tie down the shot clock, run it to 23, get a shot off. Um, but we also need to put bums on seats and make sure we're an entertaining brand of basketball. So we wanted to test our arm in that scenario. We feel like we're competitive. Um, it's going to be some just some minor um, uh, changes uh, and improvements, we feel, and we can be right up there in the top four. Corey? All right. Here we so go. My man, grown man business, Ty Wesley started off, and we all saw it the first couple of minutes into the game. He got injured, and it, that, that injury pretty much hampered him the whole year. By the time he got back right, which I don't even – I doubt if he was 100%. He wasn't able to get back right. How hungry will that man be next season? And how much are you looking forward to seeing him healthy? Where is he right now as far as his injury being fully strength, strengthened? And how much is he looking forward to coming back? put some respect on his name. Anyone who knows Ty knows he's an extraordinarily proud man. And, um, you know, it's no secret that his form was uh, below what our expectations are of him, um, what his own expectations are of himself. And that uh, he's got a little chip on his shoulder. Um, he's gone back home um, where he's got a wonderful young family, but also he's, um, he's got himself a personal trainer and he's putting himself in the best condition he possibly can. I think he'll be coming back um, the great player, the great Ty Wesley that we've seen in the past. Um, it was a very difficult situation. Anyone who saw our preseason games last year mm. would know that Ty was at the absolute peak of his powers um, in our system and that, uh, that he was, you know, setting himself up for, for uh, all NBL selection kind of season. He was in that greatest shape. He was that comfortable. Um, he didn't get the opportunity to work with Mitch in preseason at all. They never shared a training court. First time that they uh, got to work out together was game one. And uh, we saw in that first five minutes how that could work. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it was just a struggle for Ty after that to come back. He got in a lot of foul trouble early um, in his games coming back, and then he lost a little confidence, which is, uh, which is unusual for Ty. But, man, he's, a, he's a, a great player. We know that four spot, especially with Nick K opting out, is, uh, you know, he can go back and take the mantle of the best four man in the league. This might be a good time, Lynn, to drop some news on South East Melbourne Phoenix. What are you hearing? Well, <laughs> where are things at with Kendall Stevens? <laughs> there we go. My understanding is uh, those talks are, shall we say, fairly advanced. Uh, yeah, look, Kendall um, is another guy who came in all guns blazing early in the year last year. And, and uh, there's a real level of comfort. We see the great upside in Kendall's game. You know, it wasn't much well publicised, but he, he got himself a little ankle injury early in uh, mid-season and it really hampered him um, with his lateral movement um, to the point where, you know, teams started to pick on him a little at the defensive end and we needed to get that right. So he had surgery as soon as the season was over back here in Australia before heading um, back to the US and, and uh, you know, we, we're very confident Kendall will be back and part of our team. Um, you know, speak to these guys fairly regularly. I try and keep, keep their, you know, let them have their, their, their distance, but um, at the same time, touch and base. And, and our talks have been great. And his, uh, you know, his intimations have been that he can't wait to get back and start working out. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to be a, 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 I think a marriage into the future. Um, we've seen on social media some images um, out of your camp of some recent open runs you guys have been holding. Um, so something that, you know, clubs do a little bit during the off season. Melbourne is obviously a bit of a destination for guys um, if, they're, uh, if they're not necessarily playing in Europe and the like. What's, what's been going on there? Yeah, well, obviously around COVID-19 and the restrictions are placed upon us, it's been an invite only. Anyone who knows me and knows how I've operated in the past, I love to open the gym up and, and let every man and his dog come through and, and test their, test their medal against the best. And um, 
It's, uh, it's been a really good, some really strong sessions as far as personnel. The standard of basketball has not always been great. <laughs> the, uh, the work done in the driveway or the work done in the <laughs> cellar or wherever these guys have been working out hasn't quite transferred to the floor at all times. But uh, the one thing I, know, I was talking to Corey before, the, before we televised, it's just great to see these guys come in and see the smile on their faces. It's like watching little kids play. And, uh, you know, we've had some real talent, some guys from EuroLeague who are dropping in, lots of NBL guys, some free agent guys, some guys from other teams, more than welcome to come in. Um, because, yeah, Melbourne is a destination in the off season. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of guys who came down to play NBL 1, um, which was obviously cancelled, but they've come down anyways. And uh, so we're getting those guys and let them come in and help, help them get their presents. You know, a lot of these guys obviously aren't going to be part of our franchise moving forward, but um, their relationships that have been built over the years and uh, through open gyms that we've hosted, um, both here and at Melbourne United, and just I want to welcome them in. And it raises the standard of our gym and makes our players get better too. I'll tell you what, Mitch, we are, we are gagging to watch live basketball. Why don't you yeah. film it and put it on social media? We can sit there and watch these open scrimmages. It, it's crazy. I've had so many requests. Hey, can I just come down and watch? I'm like, man, no. <laughs> it's the <they're> restriction. <laughs> right. Uh, just won't allow us. So, yeah, maybe we need to start televising these. We <laughs> I, I, I have to get the, uh, the, the old uh, the buzzer going, though, because some of the language that's flying around, like everyone was real nice and cordial the first couple of weeks, but now yeah. that we've been going a little longer, the, the smack talk's kind of risen up a level. The game hasn't risen to the level of their talk right now, but it's been <laughs> fun to watch. Yeah, I know that feeling. Hey, mate, firstly, just transparency for our NBL Overtime viewers. Liam Sandemary obviously gets a finder's fee for Kendall Stevens because he found that loophole a couple of years ago. So that's why he's asking about Kendall because obviously a little money goes into his back pocket. So right. need to be transparent to the viewers. He's going to look yeah. after his commish. That's right. That's right. Hey, uh, Mitch, thank you for joining us, mate. Uh, and got to say, uh, refreshing the chat. All the NBL coaches have been great. So we've been waiting to get you on, mate, have a chat. And good luck for free agency, the off-season into uh, season two for South East Melbourne Phoenix. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Stay good safe. Good luck, coach. Look forward to seeing you all in the gym soon. News keeps flowing too. Sean Bruce announced the Sydney Kings. He's re-signed. He's going to stay. Let's have a look. A little Brucey last year. Five left. Bruce. Got Adam in the air. Didn't draw the foul. It is over. <laughs> Shabam. Um, Adam but from deep. Rebound. Who gets it? Kick it left it for Casper. Back out again. Bruce, a second go at it. Shabam! You can't give him two goes. And making Sydney having to play deep. Oh, Casper Ware gets away. Oh, he's nutmegged him. <laughs> See the replay. Crosses Detch. He's got the mismatch now with Sam Frolling. Attacks off the dribble, gets the step, and the and one finish and you know, for Sean Bruce. I did not think that he was going to have this level of impact with the Sydney Kings. Mm -hmm. An opportunity. 12 months ago, he was ringing around clubs to try and get a job. Now he's been announced another two years for Sean Bruce at the Kings. He was brilliant last year, played some big minutes in clutch times as well. And Sean Bruce resigns. And Homicide, you're a man, you love him because of his energy he brings off the bench in particular. Great signing for the Kings and great for Sean Bruce to little multi-year deal, which is you know, just reward for the great year he had. Exactly. You have to reward the guys that come in and put in work and have success on the court. He's had a career year, and as a result of it, he has two more years with the Kings. Well-deserved. No real surprise, Liam Santamaria. No, no surprise, but what an awesome story. What a great story Sean Bruce is because, I mean, we know this man was out of the league. Um, go even further back, he showed a bit at Cairns. You know, you remember Markel Starks got injured. Sean Bruce got the opportunity to play minutes and killed it for about a week or two. But, but then, uh, you know, the opportunity to kind of um, play extended minutes wasn't there. Went to Brisbane. He was set to have a, a really big year a couple of seasons ago, coming off a, a QBL MVP season. Does his ankle in the grand final series of the QBL. And that ruins that season for the Bullets. And then as a result, man was out of the league. Mm -hmm. Picked up as a mid-season kind of injury replacement for Adelaide. You know, showed that he still belongs. Didn't really show out. And then comes out with the Kings. An inspired signing by them. Um, and has a career year. Now, this time last year, he was calling clubs. Cameron Tregar, who coached him in the QBL, was out there calling clubs on his behalf. Saying, give this guy a go. Because he will come good for you. And um, you got to credit Brucey. Mm -hmm. And you got to credit the Kings for um, 
you know, making that happen. And then as you say, just reward coming out with the multi-year deal. And now the, the challenge is there for him. You know, you have that season, best six man nominee, most improved player nominee. Can you then continue to rise? You know, can you got to make sure you got, you keep improving. You don't have the, the step back like Tarangi had kind of last mm-hmm. season. The challenge now he's got that, that contract in the, in the back pocket. Keep improving. All right. That was extremely, that inspired me to speak more about, because I didn't know these things. Shout out to Bruce. Listen, what you just said was so impressive. He deserves a three-year deal. And not (laughs) only, not only will he step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. This is a lifetime underdog, Sean Bruce, okay? Those things you say resonate with me. Lack of these right opportunities. All he wanted was an opportunity. There is no way he's going backwards. There's no way. He's too hungry. He's been waiting too long. One season ain't enough. He got way more in the tank than we know. Only people who personally know him or personally know the struggle and the story will know this is only the beginning. He wanted an opportunity. He capitalized on the opportunity. It's only up from him. It's yeah. only up from him. Yeah. Shout out to Sean I'm, Bruce. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy for him because, like I said, I, I was, you know, he was set to have that big year. And and most people around the league or onlookers didn't know that he was set to. No one, not a lot of people around the country are keeping a, you know, a laser sharp focused eye on what's going on in the QBL. Mm. But mm. those that were up there were like, oh, Sean Bruce is going to come out and really show out in this NBL. And to have that injury at that bad time, I was like, oh man, I hope he doesn't look back on his career and be like, oh my God, I was right there. And then I got hurt because so many guys have that story. Right. That's the, that's the, so much of a lot of ballers stories, lose confidence, give up. And then some guys get another opportunity, but don't capitalize. It was like Mm. that again, the window of opportunity closed, but perseverance, man, I got nothing but respect for him after hearing that. Everything and then, and then, earned, nothing yeah. given. Respect. And then you love, you love the way he came out at the start of that year with the Kings last year oh, and he was shot balling. his shot. Swinging like he was, you know what I mean? Like he was coming out and making plays. He was not on the I back. I belong of the here. And I'm going to show you I belong here on the right. best team in the league. This is the thing. He didn't do it on the worst team in the league. That's easy to do. Because there's no expectations. When you're on the best team in the league doing it, yo, it, it can't be easy playing behind a Casper Ware. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Making sh- you got to hit those shots to get the minutes that you're getting, to get the confidence from the big dogs on that team to give you the ball and the confidence to take those shots. Respect, yo. You got me hey, hyped. I'm going to start Sean bringing Bruce. some real Sean Bruce energy to the uh, show. He, he's loving yo, it. Yo, I'm and, a fan. And, Look, and, and, I am a fan just like that, like a real fan now, after hearing it. And you did mention the Ruben Tarangi situation as well. And that was a little bit based on the way that they structured up Brisbane going into the next season. So you think that Sydney are going to... Well, you think Sean Bruce will probably get more opportunities based on the way he played last year because Tarangi got pushed down to pecking order. Now, we don't know what happened in preseason or how that all played out. And maybe he just didn't come back in the same type of mindset. But you have a feeling, or I have a feeling that Sean Bruce is going to play a very similar role and they're not going to sign guys around him who might take minutes. Um, maybe it means we jump around the conversation a little bit, but, but yeah. let's talk about Tarangi for a second because um, I feel like from time to time, this is a phrase that Bill Simmons has used for years on his podcast, change of scenery, guys. Who out there could, with a change of scenery... A move to a different club, a different environment, a fresh start could, you know, really blossom and excel. And Tarangi, of course, fits into that category. You know, I feel like it's just the, re- the relationship feels like it might have soured there in, in Brisbane. It's time for him to move on. I mean, he, that, and that you've got to credit Andre Lamanis for helping him get yeah. to where he got that previous season because, you know, it, the relationship, it, it, it had gone... It had um, served its time in New Zealand, but Lamana said, nah, this guy's still young. He's still got plenty to give. I'm going to bring him over. And yeah, he got those opportunities that year and he really blossomed. 
But we saw when he played for the Tall Blacks against our young Boomers team in February at the end of that season, this kid's got a big chip on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I reckon there's going to be a team out there that's going to pick up um, a really good value signing in Tarangi over this offseason. There is, there is two. Minute. Hang on, homicide. I'm going to leave Wait you. Wait a minute, Liam. I know when you talk like this, you know something. <laughs> and I'm going to back to the last week. Thank I'm you, homicide. Last week. Now, destination, right? You got me hyped. Look, shout out to Sean Bruce. I got my energy up today. <laughs> we talked about destinations for yep. players. Mm -hmm. We went back and forth about Sunday, right? Now, Not again. No, no, no. I'm going to put Sunday to the side. Thank you. Ruben Tarangi is a problem. You got to remember for those who do not, MIP and six man of the year in the same season and barely got off the, didn't even play last season. That's a two guard. I put him at the two 100%. I don't even think he's a three. I think he's a two. And I believe that he can help teams at the two. I think he should move. And I think uh, Sunday should move. Both of them to two different teams. I honestly believe that. And I believe they will shine even more. Well, I hope that does happen for Tarangi. I see him more as a three. And you can play him at the two. You can play him at the four. He can slide up those positions. Either way, let's not get stuck on that. 100% he's a change of scenery guy. Because in that game, the Tall Blacks versus the Boomers. Now, it wasn't our... It was our CD Boomers team. But there were a whole bunch of guys who are seen as future stars of the NBL like on that you know, team. Man. Sorry to cut and you off. And he all. was, along with Shaili, who's was the best player on the court mm -hmm. by a mile. The last thing we're going to do on this show is say C and D team. All right? <laughs> we're just going to say the team. That's it. Well, hang on, I'm hang on. Saying, I'm just putting it in the context. It wasn't the... It wasn't the um, a Tall Blacks team either. No, it, it wasn't. No, it was what it was, but Tarangi showed out. Because he, he played against. Made it clear that he has a lot more to give this season than he gave last season. Who do, you think he, who do you think he'll play? Where do you he'll, think? Where would you like to see him? Sorry, Cam. That's all right. You, where would you Cam, like to see you, Cam, where, first Cam, Cam, <laughs> Cam, where would you like to see him? <laughs> I'd like to see him in New Zealand. You know, we, we, we have this chat about the New Zealand player. And play I behind think, Abercrombie and Finn Delaney. Well, you know what? It won't yeah, be a stack last year. Don't get a five, you know, maybe. Johnny Hobson. Well, Hobson's got to come back. But I, I like the idea of him. I like the idea of the Kiwi-based players playing for New Zealand. We've spoken a lot about this. So that's more that theory. Just on that, just quickly. You know, I'm a gambling man every now and then. I have a flutter. He's a million to one to go back to Brisbane. I, I, I think, and I think that you're right. Change the scenery. There's, there's two, there's two players in the league right now to slap you in the face. One is Ruben Tarangi, one is Harry Froling. You know, 12 months ago he was doing NBA pre-draft workouts. We were like, this guy's going to go to the next step. You know, we, we thought this, this is his chance, and for whatever reason, be it you know a, a coaching situation or whatever it might have been, he didn't have the year that a lot of us thought he would have. So, change the scenery. If he's able to find what well, he's going to find somewhere else, he won't be back at Adelaide. He's another guy. They're the two main guys for me, Tarangi and Froling, to find new homes and see how good these guys can be because we do expect them to be good. And just on Tarangi playing for the All Blacks, the guys that he played All really against are Tall Blacks. The guys he played really well against are guys who are playing minutes in the NBL, something Great. he didn't get a chance to do last year. Does, does Cam Glidden fall into that change of scenery conversation as well? I, I, I'm not, not as far because I think that Glidden played better in the second half of the year. Not that Cam Glidden... We expect and are used to, and of course, represented Australia and, and you know, play for that Boomers team. Um, I, I think that he would probably need 12 more months to be able to find his feet maybe a little bit more. I know it sounds weird, but I don't think he was pushed as far down the pecking order as Tarangi. He still had opportunities. He just probably didn't play as well on court as we expect and know he can do. But you're right. That, that's always a, that's a good question because it wasn't a Cam Glidden we expect him to be. Let, let me throw out another curveball. This one at you, Corey. We're talking about change of scenery, guys. Does Chris Golding fall into that conversation? Where would he go? Well, 
Every you single club I mean? in the like, league. Like, where would he go? Every single club in the league would have rang him, or his management at least. I, I just, I just would be stunned if every single NBL club hasn't rang his management just to see and just to feel him out. And if you haven't, I'm talking to you, the clubs that haven't rang, just ring. Uh, I find it remarkable when professional sporting clubs don't inquire about high-profile superstars in the league who are out of contract. So call. Cool. Where, where, where do you think he'd be good at, Homicide? Or where do you think would fit him best? I think he'd play good basketball, River. Melbourne United. Hmm. There were a couple minutes. I mean, think about it. They, was, they could have been in the championship. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, they could have went to the chip. It could have been two zip, Melbourne goes to the championship. So it wasn't like the season was, I mean, although it was disappointing that they didn't, but throughout all the turmoil and ups and downs that they had, they still could have been in the championship. Mm-hmm. So I see him with Melbourne United next season. I, I've, I've got to say this as well. I agree. I think Melbourne's built a brand. I think he's, 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 he's so good for he's the profile. face of the team. He's the face of the yeah, team. Well, that's the interesting thing because Melbourne United are already putting out, they're putting out membership, mm-hmm. Paraphernalia, sign back up. Be a member for us. It's been difficult times, we know, but the league's going to be back. Chris Golding's face is not on any of that stuff. Yeah. It can't be. He's not yeah. signed to them. That's the thing. He's, he's, he's not, he doesn't have a contract with Melbourne United right now. So if you're the face of the franchise, let's get that deal done mm. and plant your face all over that stuff and bring back the members for next season. But it's more timing situation as well. And if I'm Chris Golding or if I'm anyone in his similar situation, you are probably testing free agency, one, to see what is out there, not just here in Australia, but internationally, because he had some really good games for the Boomers. So there's no doubt there would be, and probably his last opportunity to maybe get a nice European contract uh, as he's now into his 30s. Or secondly, to use it as leverage. You know, if, if, if someone comes over the top and says, we're willing, we're willing to give you this, he can go, okay, Melbourne, I want to be here. I want to play for you. I understand or how important I have been, or he might not say that in his own words, but is there a way we can get that? You know what I mean? Like you use it as leverage. I, or maybe he will. Well, no, maybe he will. I, I, I guarantee his manager will, and so well he should. So that's, that's the thing, and it's a tough situation because you want people to jump on board and in tough economic times to be a part of the journey, hopefully to get us all back in the stadiums when NBL 21 starts. And sometimes the timing just didn't work. But you do make a good point, Liam. Here's what I'd like to see, though, from Melbourne United when it comes to Chris Golding. Don't go get an import one. Don't go get an import one. Let's, let's share the, the point guard minutes between Mitch McCarron and Shay Ely. Mm-hmm. And, and, and re-sign Chris Golding and say, and, and make, go back to the, to the time when he was a focus for you offensively. Like he was at the end of last season. Mitch McCarron did a great job handling the rock and running that team and getting Chris Golding the ball to open ball games late in that season. Um, and I know he's, you know, when he signed that three year deal with Melbourne, United, Mitch McCarron, he wants opportunities to play the one. Um, we know he can defend. He's an elite defender. You know, Shay coming off the bench to play minutes at the point guard spot. He's an elite defender. You don't need to worry about, geez, how are we going to guard a guy like Scott Machado or these types of players? If we don't have, you know, a Casper Ware level, import one defender you've got those guys go McCarron and Illy at the one and make Golding the man for you offensively at the two almost go one step further because that final series and late in the year when they had Mellow Trimble coming off the bench and that's something they would have to find if they don't get Mellow Trimble back which I have no idea where that is they've got to be able to find it would be unlikely I think to be able to find someone who can pack a scoring punch off the bench which Mellow Trimble did so well when he bought into that role so you had McCarron and Shaley starting, which automatically makes you a hell of a lot better defensively in the backcourt. Chris Golding freed up offensively. And that's really, I know it was a short sample, but it was also the sample that, as Homicide, you pointed out, they nearly made a grand final on. If you're able to find a, a I don't know if you're able to go in and get a, you know, just a high profile scorer to come off the bench, an American that can do it. I'm not certain if there'll be heaps out there be willing to play that role from the get go. But if you're able to find that again, that's the best way to go about it. No doubt about it, because Trimble and Golding didn't work together for whatever reason. And, and I think the results and the stats back both that up. Liam, mm. I like where your head's at. I like the money-making Mitch at the point, mm-hmm. Shelly at the backup spot. We know that's going to work, mm-hmm. right? Let Goulin get off more. I'm cool with that. 
Here's the key, which was the key again last season. What is Casey Prather going to look like? Right? You know this team is not in the business of going to finals. They're in the business of going to the mm-hmm. grand final to win championships. Mm-hmm. That's what they want to be every year. Mm-hmm. They want to be the benchmark. They're going to need a five. And hope that Casey Prather's good money. I'm good with that team. That team right there is championship contender. Um, you asked before, Corey, like where would he go? Mm. There's been, I mean, one of the, one team that people have wondered about is what will Chris Golding look like at the Sydney Kings? <clears throat> right? No Kevin Lish, um, so on and so forth. But and this maybe just pivots our conversation in a little bit of a different direction. I'm starting to get the sense and the feeling that Didi Luzada is looking more and more likely that he's going to return and play for the Kings again last season. Not something we've ever seen from an ex star. Mm-hmm. We know they're signed to two year deals for the purpose of the buyout and so on and so forth, but he's a different next star to all the other ones that we've had. He's not going into the draft. It's a draft and stash situation. We know the Pelicans um, really, really happy with what happened with him last season in Sydney under Will Weaver and the influence of of Andrew Bogut and that team. It was, um, you know, he had a bunch of injury interruptions, but David Griffin came over. We know Cam, he was sitting on the baseline, watching Didi ball out in the big moments of game one of the semifinal series. And I'm starting to get more and more the impression, talking to different people, um, seeing what's going on, that that it's, I wouldn't be shocked to see. I mean, we see the Kings put, you know, they put the Sean Bruce signing out. And then at the bottom of that announcement, it shows who's, who's signed. Um, and they mentioned Didi Lizata. Yes, of course, technically he is signed. I think the expectation was that he was going to go back to the Pelicans. Would not be surprised now to see the Pelicans stash him with the Kings again for a second season. So last year we know that there was a cutoff date. I think it was, it might've even been New Year's Eve where it wasn't like the Pelicans could call him up in Feb in a grand final series, something we spoke about and the Kings sort of addressed a couple of times as well. This would be interesting. If, if I was the Pelicans, the best thing to do would be to bring him back because he's going to get a head start on the NBA. The NBA might still will be going, which the Pelicans won't be involved come, say, the NBA finals in the middle of October. Touch wood, the NBL 21 can get going, at least from a preseason perspective, around that time. He can spend you know, a couple of months in camp, or however long that might be, into a season. Now, that might be they're toing and froing and like, hey, we want to get a head start on him, but we're going to bring him back at a certain point. If I was the Pelicans, the best thing to do would be to bring Diddler's out of Sydney and work a way not to guarantee the whole year. Now, would Sydney be into that? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But from a Pelican's point of view, everything they were happy with last year, it would add to it if Didi can get on the court and have two months in a professional setting again before maybe getting a call up. But that's, that is an interesting one because we've never seen a two-yearer. Mm. Mm. And, that's, and that's your starting two guard. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Injury hampered him so much from what we've mm. seen. I know you... Well, actually, we famously remember Homicide throwing the headsets and microphone after Didi hit eight threes <laughs> against Perth down in Hobart. I'm going to say this right here about Didi. One, you know I'm a fan. Didi's a stud, right? Mm-hmm. Young stud. Now, check this. His role will be bigger this season mm. based off the fact that it's one less import spot. Mm-hmm. So he's going to have a lot of opportunity to continue to develop because he finished off strong last season. Yeah, he had a lot of injuries, but just look at it like this, like you're saying from the Pelicans' perspective. Yeah, whatever, forget this season, right? Next season, NBA is projected to start in like Christmas, right? So they say, Christmas. This season is a short season. So he can play out this whole season and jump right into their season. You know what I'm saying? Like, why wouldn't you? Why would you want your young talent to to join you guys and potentially just be sitting? Let him play. That's how he develops. So, I mean, why not? Yeah. When you look at it from that perspective and that standpoint, he'll be here next season. It Mm, sounds about right. And, I mean, obviously, it depends on... I mean, there's a lot of water to go under the bridge, right? There are a few guys that play his positions on that Pelicans roster. Yeah, if a couple of those guys go down, 
you know, they do knees, touch wood in the next little while, a few months or whatever, then that, that changes things. But at, I think it's a, it's a credit to the Kings, the fact that this is a conversation because the way they handled things with him, the fact that they, didn't, they never took any risks with him uh, physically. No. The moment anything there was, sit down, mate. Sit down. We're going to look after you. That's the way they approach all their players. And, and they've took a long-term view in that regard. So, well, look, geez, you know, like if we put Didi back on the floor, we might win this game. Yeah. But if we look after this kid, then the word spreads. Firstly, the Pelicans feel like we're doing the right thing by him. But then the word spreads between players and agents and organizations that this team does the right thing by your guys. Um, and then it's also a credit to Didi because a lot of guys in draft and stash situations, they head overseas and they, their focus is on the box score. I just doesn't matter whether the team wins or loses or what happens in terms of assimilating with a team. It's got to put up numbers. Hey, we saw that with Jordan McRae when he came here and played for Melbourne United. And it didn't, the guys don't like playing with that dude. Whereas Diddy comes in and does all the right things, approaches the game in the right way. And it's a total win-win situation. And as a result, we're sitting here and they're all having those conversations right now about potentially bringing him back. No doubt. Yeah, Can't wait for any other news? Diddy's a certified young pro. We saw that. Well, you guys saw it way before I did. Mm-hmm. And then I saw it in the preseason in Tassie. Like, he just plays the game the right way as it comes to him. So, he'd be a pleasure to play with. Mm. I think I called him. I, I think I said he'd be all NBL second team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you might Maybe not be wrong. First. Next season, it might have been a year. Early. It, was the, it was the Vegas air got me, but he was really good in, uh, in summer league. Hey, before we get out of here, hashtag NBL over top and get involved. Any other news kicking around, Liam, you've got? Uh, well, actually, but, well, if you've got nothing, really. Yanni well, Wetzel. <laughs> Yanni Wetzel signing, of course, on the Breakers, on the Breakers Twitter page. And we, we love him. He be, uh, we hope NBL over time's own is in the league next year. Or this is going to be NBL Euro League going forward. Liam. Yanni is here. <laughs> I think it comes as no surprise to hear, I'm sure, that, that the breakers are generally considered to be, you know, in the front seat the, 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 to, to sign Yanni Wetzel. There are a number of teams who really like this kid and, and are keen to get him on board. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is part of the reason why they're considered to be leading that race is because my understanding is Jack Salt's gone elsewhere. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of things linking Jack Salt to the Adelaide 36s, which is, is interesting. We, we know Jeff Van Groningen's in there moving and shaking and, and looking at to, to, to sign guys to that squad. They've got Daniel Johnson. Um, Harry Froling is going elsewhere. Jack Salt, um, we, we saw what he was able to do at college at Virginia. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of talk about uh, okay. Salt and the City of Churches. Anything on anything extra around Jack White this week? No, things are going a little quiet. I've I've been told that the Sydney Kings are maybe back in that conversation a little bit, but um, no, nothing concrete to report on Jack White right now. Homicide, are you dressed for something you've already done or something you're about to do? Something I've already done. Okay, you can't a little, little tease of what it is. No. <laughs> Just, you know, spreading good vibes. Okay. Uh, NBL podcast, big week, of course, this week. Mm. Catch, catch Gibbo tomorrow. We'll be back NBL Rewind. A legend is joining us, Liam Santa Maria, on Thursday. Can't wait to DMAC pops in and say, says good day as well. Hashtag NBL Overtime to get involved. We will see you all again next Tuesday.